Greetings! Before you watch the video, I just want to state um, something or state a little bit about it. Um, I ran into some problems making it. Um, it was really a big topic. I didn't wrote a script because I hadn't really time for it and I was aware it is a, like, a big topic. And in my mind I was like, oh, I'm more effective if I don't write a script for it. Um, I actually wrote scripts like for my last videos and this turned out pretty well. And um, actually I wanted, intended to really write a script now for every video. But here, because of my time frame through my work and other commitments, I wasn't really able to do and I, was, I, I thought I can just do it freestyle, which I actually do most of my videos on this channel and the past at least. And yeah, then I had the issue that every time I recorded it, I wasn't satisfied with it, it was bad. And I did it again and again and again and again. There's also a reason at this time why it's actually delayed so long. I, now I also had like other videos delayed a long time because also of my time. But this time it, I had actually the time. I had really the first version actually recorded like four days after or three days after the, my last um, Swiss Mercenary video. And yeah, so you see I actually really recorded it over and over again through this time and actually start editing it and then realizing it's bad and I have to do another one. This version I would say it's okay, but here now I realize that I have many little mistakes in it which really annoy me like I call things just wrongly or in a different way um, because I confuse some terms from English to German. Um, or just assume that it's different called or just assume this is a translation or actually I didn't realize that there is a, just another kind of different way to call something which doesn't destroy the meaning or the, the content of uh, my, my statements in here or of this video so much and I actually try to really bring in so detailed information like a specific date of something a year or so in my um, like little templates I put in the video um, since like the last two or so but the point is I actually not completely satisfied with this one, but I can't just now go every uh, do everything over again and write first the script and everything. Then it will actually take I don't know maybe uh, three weeks again. And I really kind of think is a video it's fine. You can get some information out of it. You really see also to the connection to this topic that there's a lot more to it, to the history of the Swiss mercenaries than just like one or two battles and stuff like this. And uh, I really want to get on with the, my next video. So this is maybe something I will redo uh, in some time. I actually have this in my mind to redo some videos because I just improved in the way I make videos. But yeah, so just that you know this is maybe a little bit uh, confusing at some points or I uh, talk a little bit strange. The flow of the videos is maybe not as good as my last ones, I think. <laughs> and um, just that you know I'm aware of many of uh, the negative points in this video so uh, but I hope you still can like find enjoyment in here oh joy and also can get some information out of it and yeah like I said hope uh, hopefully see you in the next video again and um, I think have fun with this one hopefully so bye bye Greetings, Clausewitz here. So in this video I want to talk about how the Swiss mercenaries became widespread and famous in Europe. And basically this fame is still um, present today when people like uh, look into it and talk about it and yeah, there's also a lot of misconceptions or just myths around them and like how they um, like arise through this uh, famous and effective mercenary force in the late 15th century. And I also kind of want to address those myths um, partially in here and I also want to show you like also my conclusion like why they became so famous, why people then hired them in such a large scale and etc etc. I talked before about like the tactics and also pointed out that actually the tactics were pretty effective of course and you maybe guessed there already this was also a factor but I wouldn't say this is the main reason they became suddenly so present in Europe not only as uh, pure mercenaries for wars for battles but also as um, actually very um, kind of standing armies um, in the Vatican for example still like to until today um, kind of, um, even it's just like ceremonial, ceremon ceremonial, I can't say this word, ceremonial. Uh, um, even though they are actually Swiss soldiers, but we don't want to talk about like the Vatican Swiss Guard here. Uh, but actually, um, we also had those things like in France, for example. France had actually a long history of hiring Swiss into their forces. And um, the whole uh, Swiss tradition of actually selling soldiers um, was pretty long. So the thing is, 
this is actually like started it at the point at the end of 15th century and I want to show you like how it came to this point. This is a lot of history actually. I actually talk about the time frame of 200 years here. Basically the end of the 13th century when the old confederation um, actually were founded. Basically it wasn't called uh, this uh, at this point. It's just like this, this alliance between those cities which became later than the Swiss confederation and uh, which is then also called Switzerland today. Um, and the term we use today for basically the states and the alliances before the Swiss Confederation, before the Helvetic Republic or how it's called, um, basically is the term the Old Confederation or the Old Swiss Confederation. So when I say those, this name, then I refer basically to um, the, the precessor states of the Switzerland from today. I can't go into m much detail in here. I will, of course, go into some detail, uh, especially when, uh, when I address here my points or I want to form an argument, of course, then I will show details, but I can't give you like the whole politic political factors and every event uh, uh, and system explain every concept would happen then this would just take too long and I'm not actually a political channel here and talk about basically like I said or actually stay there every point in my videos and my channel about military history and theory so I just want to show you basically the military side of this history and uh, what I think here was an influence also of course go into some politics because it is heavily connected to it and of course war is also connected to politics so we can't go away from the politics but the point is I will be brief about the political systems of the time. If you're uh, curious about more about the political side here then of course you can just tell me and maybe then I consider making a video about it. Um, but the point is, then you really have to go look into a Wikipedia article, so which are pretty detailed about this too, and where I actually got most of my information from, because like I stated in my um, trailer, so my channel trailer, I think some of you don't actually see it or watch it because you already subscribed, but I basically draw my informations from like official and. Uh, the official sources which are public and which uh, most historians also agree on I often and also read into like controversies uh, discussions uh, among like um, students of history classes or professors or whatever but the point is um, I really want to keep it basic and something we have uh, we can also agree on is uh, likely was likely to happen um, which likely happened but um, when I like kind of say something against the public opinion or the official Informations or so then I also will argue for it. So don't worry that I just like throw stuff at you This is all has is connected to those uh, public informations and when I say something against it or have an own thesis I will mark it as like this is what I think based on this and this just that you know a little bit of a disclaimer here So let us jump into it. So the point is because it's such a long time frame I have to be brief in some 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 this, um, extent um, I basically now part this um, the whole frame into three big conflicts, and basically like um, after the start of this uh, city alliance, so basically the first steps of the old Swiss Confederation, um, and till the point like the end of the 15th century when we see um, the first time in the French uh, in France, um, like in the French um, court of the French king. We see the first guard units of Swiss soldiers. Um, also, we see mercenaries of the, um, also the, of the Swiss Confederation all around Europe, and, and may, well, not all about Europe, but basically uh, big parts of Europe. Um, so we have those three conflicts, and these are we have three big events which shaped a lot or influenced a lot the history of the old Confederation, and and therefore also the, of the Swiss mercenaries. And these conflicts are first. The Habsburg conflict, uh, or the conflict with the Habsburgs, uh, Habsburg dynasty. The second one is the Old Zurich Krieg, uh, which is can be translated like the, um, the Old Zurich War. So I said Old Zurich Krieg, it's a little bit confusing actually. Sometimes it's hard for me to distinguish proper in the languages between like um, official German names for events or states and then uh, or, or people and then going for like transition to English ones and. Like that, sometimes a little bit tricky, so you have to forgive me that. But the point is, like the third conflict, which was the uh, Burgundy Wars, and um, basically right after that we see all those mercenaries coming, and so we have those big conflicts here. And uh, when we look at the first one, the conflict with Habsburgs, um, the point is those cities actually, which were forming the first um, confederation. Um, were actually lands of the Habsburg dynasty, but they came, um, actually were uh, getting uh, Reichsfrei, 
um, or Reichs unmittelbar is also another term for this concept. Basically what this means is this can be given two people, two cities, two lands, so two titles um, uh, to auto organizations. So what this means is that those titles, those persons are now direct vessels of the Kaiser, of the Emperor, of the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Empire. Mm. But um, therefore, they basically um, have their own jurisdiction now, they have their own administration and everything, because in the feudal system, when there's basically like a duke and he has um, vessels, he of course has the jurisdiction about it, and so on, so on. Of course, there are is, is, uh, an instance above him, the Kaiser, like I said, but he is not has not full authority about uh, above all the lands. Of course, he has full authority about his own lands. And basically, making something rise free or rise unmittelbar is basically bringing those people into the state. But he won't interfere right now. This is also um, a tool to conf uh, to solve conflicts. Uh, basically, it was given to other cities in German lands as well, like Colonia, um, because they grew in power and had then conflicts with the nobles. Um, well, the nobles with them, basically, but um, also it's of course uh, can be also uh, used to actually take power away from certain noble dynasties or give the emperor more power and so on and so on. And it was actually a reward for those cities for I think they helped uh, the emperor in some war in the battle. I'm not so sure about this right now, um, and this is actually not so important. The important is they get uh, Reichsfrei and. Um, and therefore, we are not actually a part anymore of the Hartford dynasty, on one is not their uh, lands anymore, which they don't like. And this is like the start of the conflict with the Habsburgs. And basically, that we are trying to get it back. And this is something actually you see throughout those 200 years, basically. Um, it really ends in the uh, start of the 16th century, if I correctly, with the Schwabenkriege, the Swabian Wars. Uh, basically, they are, uh, the Swiss Confederation are really establishing themselves completely off the Habsburgers and there was no attempt anymore, I think, um, to retake it back. But basically, through the early history of the Swiss Confederation, this is marked um, and defined by the Habsburgs trying to get them back. So, therefore, this first conflict, which has also many factors and many reasons and many events in there. But what is um, important here, considering the military side of everything, was that actually, at some point, the Habsburg dynasty Get, were getting the crown of the German lands of the Holy Empire and basically could now um, rework the whole Reichsfreiheit and therefore taking those lands finally back. And basically this was some, uh, something couldn't address all the time or at the start because they had other political uh, goals and also conflicts uh, inside the empire. But they basically were then um, sending an army into the confederation to of course enforce now the, um, that they were uh, a part of the Habsburgs uh, again. And the Swiss Confederation were then, of course, um, actually were, um, were standing their ground because they don't want to be part of them again. And here gets a little bit tricky, actually, because there is like this famous battle about this uh, conflict, the battle at Morgarten, which is often quoted as like the beginning of the Swiss mercenaries and that they already used this in their famous tactics and basically there, yeah, there was their foundation for it. And I actually doubt it heavily, not, not only I, but basically historians are not uh, sure anymore. Actually they discuss if there was even a battle at Morgarten and I would say it is highly unlikely that there was a battle at all because uh, we don't have physical evidence at the site that there was any battle uh, in this time, and actually the first writings, the first sources for this battle were like um, written like I think 20 or 30 years after the battle was the first, and actually all the other chronicles are then based on those, on this one. And therefore we can just have to say it is very unlikely that this battle happened. We know that they were sending an army in there and that they failed. Um, I would actually suggest that it was more of a guerrilla war in here, so the Swiss were using their terrain, which is not suited basically for cavalry, uh, by the way, of most of it. Um, also, they used, of course, their knowledge, really very basic, very classical guerrilla warfare, like in, later on in Spain um, against Napoleon. But the point is, um, I would say this is the, what happened, and therefore they uh, inflicted casualties among the um, army, especially the knights, is something. Um, which is also mentioned in the chronic, uh, not in the chronic, the chronicle, and I can actually imagine this is true here because it's, it just makes sense in it all. Um, if you lose like the best troops you have, and also uh, these troops were part of the political system because they were nobles, this is something which is also 
recorded in a sense it has an influence in other parts uh, as in other lands and this is something which also would lead to like just retreating and just leave it be and um, the Swiss Confederation at this point didn't have the resources actually to really of course pull a full-scale war um, off because they were just cities and not as so powerful uh, as one city as uh, other cities like in the north of Italy or in um, also more in the north of Germany therefore I would say they actually fought like a really a guerrilla war and where so many. Like I said, we don't have actually any uh, information about this anymore. So this is where I, we can't really just say something else and um, be confident. Well, of course, we can form our thesis um, everywhere, but mm, um, I would say this is the most likely one. Also, we don't see um, any mercenaries coming up then. This is something which is also strange. Because if they had those unique fighting techniques and were able to defeat one of the strongest dynasties in the lands, then why it's not having an impact internationally? It's really just like, oh yeah, this happened and nobody cares about it. This is also strange. So, this is basically the first part. But of course they had this conflict with the Habsburgs. And of course this was, I would say, the first step of getting this fame. Because, like I said, those cities were defiling basically one of the biggest dynasties or more, uh, mightiest dynasties in Europe, especially in German lands. So, of course, this um, is not that this uh, happened the first time in Europe, so this is nothing special for itself. But of course, um, chained with the events later on, this then has an impact. So the second conflict is more of a civil war, and this is um, called the Alte Zürich Krieg, which is translated to like the Old Zürich War. Basically, the city of Zürich, which, which was a part of this alliance of this confederation, had an issue with the other cities, and it was then growing into war. Also, the city of Zurich were then siding with the Habsburg dynasty, with the Kaiser, which was from Habsburg, um, because the Habsburg saw an opportunity to get lands back, of course. Later on, they even called upon help on the French king, uh, the Kaiser, not Zurich. And um, so we actually have a really big business here, basically this little, little confederation against the Kaiser and the French king. And this is now uh, like the first half of the 15th century and it's like shortly after the Hundred Years War. And the point is, um, here we actually have evidence uh, and hints for those different battles which happened there. But nothing in detail actually and not um, some so necessary very big ones. So there's also, I wouldn't say that they had their special tactics already established there, but I would say they actually were on the first steps because there were it seems some uh, field battles or to an extent. And one uh, which is actually kind of st um, standing out of all of them, and I would say this is a very important part in the chain for their fame. And this is the battle at St. Jakob at, uh, at, at the Burs. Uh, basically, yeah, the Schlacht at St. Jakob on the Burs. And there were like different cities called in St. Jakob or St. Jacob. I hope Jacob's the right thing here because some Latin names actually are a little bit different between English and German or. German and English have like their different forms of them, but um, this was a city and it's like uh, on this river under Bills and the point is that there was the case actually shortly after the French king was entering the war. Basically he uh, sent out the Dauphin, which was basically the heir for the king title, um, with his army which were also considering of some mercenary form, as of some like um, known mercenaries of the South France area and which were also feared for um, re, um, uh, regular plundering. So it was also a fear of the confederation that those uh, army would then really just pillaging all of their lands and cities. And this was a bit, pretty big, big force, like 20,000 men. Um, and they were entering the city and they wanted to, I think, think lay siege on Bern, when I remember correctly. So one of the cities of the confederation. And they were going in and Basically, this battle at St. Jakob is not a real battle in this case. Um, like, they were starting to siege, uh, sieging um, Bern, I think. And basically, a vanguard of uh, the Confederation were coming up and were actually like, scouting what's happening and so on. And as a small force, 1,800 men or so. And they were then actually facing the vanguard of the French army here which were probably doing the same thing. And they, um, the Confederation soldiers were defeating this uh, French vanguard and it is said that they were very encouraged to it, they were really uh, like a wild bunch of, um, of guys, of young men and eager for glory and stuff like this. And they were just then going through um, in the direction of the army and against their orders, like 1,500 of them were then also crossing the bills. 
which was the river, and then we are facing the whole of the French army, or basically the, the, yeah, the real arm, part of the army, not because the vanguard is also part of the army, but you know what I mean. And they were of course heavily outnumbered, but they were just charging in. There's also this connection about like this famous Swiss charge thing I mentioned in my first video. And they were charging in and basically lost and we are then also, many of them were killed there, then we are then also retreating back into I think it was like um, some some um, some little buildings there were around like maybe uh, so something like uh, um, I don't know what is gehöft in English right now but like a building for from farmers or something like this where they just can barricade themselves in there and then they were um, refusing to capitulate and um, killed off completely except for two or so but the point is this is maybe those details are not so true but the very important point is here they inflicted many casualties among the French army estimated like four thousand. And also another uh, army of the Confederation were also forming. And this led to the event that basically the Dauphin, the uh, commander of the French army, was then um, actually um, not breaking the siege, but cancelling the siege and also retreating. And many parts of his force were actually scattered. And this was basically the entry of France and they were actually winning a battle, but the results were not pleasant and they were then retreating. And they couldn't like just go on with it because also of the danger of this um, like also like twenty thousand uh, men strong force of the confederation approaching. So basically, um, this this uh, defeat were actually leading to a victory overall. And this is uh, really I would say a very important event here because we have this this just this this uh, thing happening that this Swiss confederation guys. This basically no, not nobles, this commoners, and very heavily outnumbered, were inflicting so much ca uh, casualties on this uh, French army, and uh, also this whole um, legend that they were so fero ferocious and so fearless or whatever and refused to surrender. This could be actually part of legends because later on, also like the last uh, 200 years of recent history, because there was a lot of nationalism going on also in this, uh, Switzerland, therefore this could be more fabricated back then, but this is not impossible to happen. I can imagine that in this case it was supposed uh, it actually happened, and this was um, in connection with the fact that the Confederation were also beating the Habsburgs before, now like defiling, uh, defiling the Habsburgs again, basically, and also the French king, and also like this, um, this um, victory and defeat stuff, and the charge and everything, were something also impressive and something uh, other people are like, of course telling about or sp speaking about like oh those um, Swiss were defeating the French, defeating the Habsburgs, defying the Kaiser and stuff like this and actually the Confederation were then also winning this whole war this whole civil war against Zurich and yeah were pretty successful again and I would say that they actually had like I said before um, first, first form of their tactics maybe they hadn't pikes Maybe they hadn't harbors or not as many as such. I, this is, there's, like I said, no details about it. I can't imagine they had harbors because, like I said, the concept of the harbor is pretty old and you can easily for, um, actually make harbors out of um, tools. So, like shovels or stuff like this, you can easily make a harbor out of it. So, basically, this is something where I would say um, we have the first occurrence of the Swiss mercenary tactics in an early form, I would guess, and also con in connection with their victories and um, also especially against their mighty um, enemies. Um, this is something where people are really speaking about those guys and um, like referring to like, oh, they are so effective, look at their victory. So basically we now came or coming to the end phase and this is um, this last conflict, which is the war with Burgundy. The Duke of Burgundy was actually at this point, and we're talking now about like the end of the 15th century, so the, the second half of it, I think it was like 1474 or so, where it was starting this war. And the Duke of Burgundy at this point was one of the mightiest um, states, mightiest lords in Europe, even though, even though he was like under um, a vessel of the French king, but he was very powerful at this, uh, for himself and had many lands across Europe, not only in Burgundy. And he had also like the best organized army actually at the time, which is also a pretty interesting concept. I will talk about this at some point also, which also had actually very much mercenaries in there, but at an own organization style. But like I said, I will talk about them in a different video. The point is, um, he was one of the or state or like the um, Duchy of Burgundy was one of the strongest states in Europe. Uh, they had basically the best army or what was considered the best army at this point, and. 
they were then also going to war against the Swiss Confederation. I think actually this time uh, the Swiss Confederation also was siding with the Habsburg dynasty, which is kind of ironic. But of course, Burgundy was a big, um, uh, a big political rival for the Kaiser, for basically everyone in Europe. So this actually makes sense that they helped here them. Um, also, I think um, it was about also some succession theme politics when I remember correctly, because with the death then later on of the Duke of Burgundy, the Habsburgs were getting actually lands to the, uh, through that. But like I said, I don't want to get into politics in so much detail in here. Important is, there are many, some battles in there and basically Burgundy was were losing them. <laughs> Especially like the last three, I think. And the last one, actually, the Duke of Burgundy um, wa was killed. Unless he died, if he was like, oh, probably was killed. <laughs> so, but uh, from, the, from his enemies or from somebody else, so his own troops maybe. But doesn't matter, I'm kind of rambling here. The point is, um, the Swiss were also successful again, even though they had help to the hard works of so, but not so heavily. And the point is, I'm pretty sure that this is the point where they had their tactics now. Because what you also see is that pretty much right afterwards, we have the Swiss mercenaries in Europe. Um, for example, um, the French king already, or shortly afterwards, this point, like three years later or so, actually France were making a contract with the Swiss Confederation for hiring soldiers. And then we have the hundred Swiss, or so they were called, basically there were hundred Swiss guardsmen for the French king. And they had made a contract about them, like how many men, the salary for them, how they were supplied, which kind of supplies, the uniforms, etc, etc. So the point is, we see like this official business between those two states for selling soldiers. And basically this is something they actually did for centuries from this point, selling soldiers into uh, for, uh, uh, at others, uh, to other states in Europe. And we also see then all those mercenaries coming originally from the Swiss, fighting in the Swiss manner, which is actually often referred to in history. And um, they proved also to be effective. And shortly afterwards, really some years later, we see then the Landsknechts coming up, basically taking this concept of the Swiss and improving it, altering it, adapting it to the circumstances, and then later on we see other uh, other improvements, adaptations from other peoples, and also then uh, we see like this whole mercenary business and this whole style of formation or the the basic idea of this formation um, occurring throughout Europe in different forms and of course competing with each other, and actually the Swiss style pretty much disappearing pretty early on. But um, the basic idea of it, so actually to defend with pikes and then doing the killing power with something else, I would just say it. this is this is the basic, but to defend yourself with pikes and with organized infantrymen, this is basically which survived until uh, line infantry, until we really had, um, and basically muskets were taking over. And um, so we talk about like the 17th century here, so and not uh, completely from the start, pikes were actually sometimes, I think like, until the half of the 17th century around. But the point is, for the next centuries, basically, we see this type of basic formation in different forms. And I will talk about like the consequences of um, what the Swiss were bringing in, what they were changing, and basically the consequence of those changes, actually, in the next video. But the point is, you see um, the, the connection I took uh, I did here. Because of their um, historical victories against mighty adversaries, and of course, also because they had a unique tactic which was successful, and I talked about in my early video, in my first video, why it was successful, why it was effective. Also, the whole economic perspective, um, especially for the Swiss Confederation to sell soldiers, was also pretty important. This is um, something other states and also wanted. Um, therefore, it was really official business, not only free Swiss going out looking for uh, for opportunity of making money therefore also train local recruits in the Swiss formation but um, we see like um, the guardsmen in the uh, French code and at, uh, this actually inspired then also the Pope to make basically the same thing which um, lasts till today and um, like I said then we see people copying the whole system and this was based on of course their fame. The people would know those guys could actually do this and the Swiss Confederation were actually emphasizing the whole mercenary business because they didn't have the best economy in their lands. They couldn't really emphasize so much on um, agriculture 
because they were basically around, surrounded by hills and mountains. Uh, this is basically in the Alps, so um, it's not the best potential for this there. They had important trading routes, but those had other cities as well. So basically, uh, this is also the reason why they actually were forming this confederation, because they couldn't compete on their own with other city-states like in North Italy, like Florence and um, Venedi uh, uh, Venezia, um, Ven Venice. Mm. Can, like I said, I sometimes confuse the terms in different languages, but the point is, um, they had therefore, because they hadn't the best economical side, um, making an alliance and everything, they had uh, for this reason also many young folks which were unemployed basically, hadn't work, hadn't money. This was, of course, a factor for um, that they had therefore a higher criminal rate, uh, um, as a more higher crime rate. Um, it was um, disrupting the peace and the lands and everything and this was the perfect solution for them they were gaining money they were actually taking all those young folks out of the street also now more Swiss have money so um, this is also good for the economics and yeah basically this was therefore heavily emphasized and um, of course other people needed soldiers as well also um, like I said then inspiring other people to do the same thing because, like I said in my first video, a really big advantage of this whole concept is that you can't just take peasants from, from your lands directly, give them very cheap weapons, and then you, of course you have to train and organize them, but then you have an effective force which can compete with all the noble forces out there. Which is cr pretty crazy actually when you like look at it from the perspective of like a medieval noble. Uh, because you're trained for years and have, because of your high wealth, all those um, actually high quality, high quality, not equality, but high quality equipment. To and you basically the 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 uh, the core of like effective fighting force. You're the reason why armies are effective, and then there are the Swiss mercenaries. Of course, mercenaries are around before. I talked about this, I think, in my first video as well. But not in this organized state, and they never had such a distinct formation or tactic, and therefore this was the reason why actually the Swiss were. Even though the Landsknechts and the Spanish Tercio was also improving their system, but they were still hired the Swiss mercenaries. Of course, they also adapted to some point, um, and maybe that was there wasn't a distinction between Swiss mercenary tactics and Landsknecht mercenary tactics anymore. But the point is, the fame of the Swiss hold basically on for centuries that they could sell, sell soldiers because they trained them also so basically you just had, could, had to pay the confederation that we were getting soldiers out of it it's also an amazing opportunity for states and yeah I hope that it all makes sense what I was talking about and I don't ramble too much um, it was um, actually a little bit hard for me to do this video because I talk more about like tactics and armies and, and wars in a, in a like general matter or just a war, not so much about the politics besides of this, um, or about specific troops, but the point is, I really think this is important here because it was not only their unique tactics or their effective tactic that they were hired and widespread, also the fame of their victories um, and also that the whole, uh, emphasis, the whole um, economic side of the confederation to do this was also something why this was then so popular and so uh, you and used and therefore creating opportunities or a new market for soldiers in Europe which was then emphasized on other factions, other people, other group. And yeah, like I said, I will talk in my next video more about like the war-related changes, the tactical and strategic-related changes the Swiss were bringing in. Of course, I mentioned them here and in my first video uh, briefly uh, before, but I really want to explain them uh, furthermore and to, sh and to show which consequences actually were bringing in. And yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this video here. And if so, then give it a like and subscribe to my channel if you not already did. I talk about military related stuff in here. And hopefully, see you soon.